In this lunchtime session, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Peter Message. In this, uh, in this morning's opening session, many of you may have attended the first morning session when we heard about the management of lower limb thrombosis. And now we extend this to look at the endovascular management of PE, considering what this can offer and who may benefit, and importantly, timely management to maximize the benefit of these minimally invasive procedures for patients. So without any more delay, I will pass over to Peter. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the introduction and thanks for the opportunity from the organizers. Um, my name is Peter Mezesh. I'm an interventional radiologist in Bristol. And as an interventional radiologist, uh, I block and unblock vessels. That's my mm, job. So today I'd like to talk about unblocking pulmonary arteries. Um, we all know that P is, is a serious condition. It's the third most frequent cause for cardiovascular mortality. And actually its annual incidence is rising, which might have something to do with COVID. We're not entirely sure, but also reperfusion or removing clot from pulmonary arteries drew much less attention compared to other cardio cerebrovascular uh, fields. Um, and that's what we like to talk about today. Um, so again, we all, probably most of you know that uh, severe or massive P has a very high mortality that up to one third of the patient can die within 30 days. And the main cause for this is the um, outflow blockage and which leads to a vicious circle or more like a downward spiral uh, causing right ventricular dysfunction, eventually failure, which can lead to the worst case scenario and to the patient's death. And therefore a reperfusion therapy to relieve this obstruction uh, could help to disrupt this uh, downward spiral and save the patient. So what options do we have to, to remove clots? Obviously we can do the systemic thrombolysis where we give large volume of thrombolytic into the systemic circulation to break up the clots. Or we can ask one of our surgical, for cardiothoracic surgeon colleagues to remove clots surgically, or there is this uh, collective terms of catheter-directed treatments, which I'd like to go in more details. Systemic thrombolysis has been around for the longest time, and this is the still the accepted first-line treatment in severe PE. Um, there are all sorts of different drug administration regimens out there, but the, probably the most widely used is the ESC guideline, uh, one where we give 100 milligram of alteplase over two hours. We know that it improves right ventricular dysfunction quickly and also improves mortality in the high risk patients, but it comes at a cost, which is a significant risk of major bleeding, 10 to 20% according to some studies. And there is a significant risk of intracerebral hemorrhage of around 2.5% up to 5% according to some other data. Um, also a big drawback of this that because of the risk of bleeding up to 50% of the patients cannot have it because of the contraindications. Um, for the intermediate group of patients, uh, we don't know if it makes any benefit. The improvement in mortality is not proven, or there is some data that it improves the long-term functional capacity and quality of life if they receive thrombolysis. To reduce the bleeding risk, there had been attempt to, to do it with lower doses, uh, to reduce the do lytic dose 25 to 50% with various results. According to some studies, um, it can increase to the rate of treatment escalation and it does not really change the bleeding risk when we do it with lower dose. So if we are lucky to be in an institution where cardiothoracic surgery is readily available, then we can uh, have surgical thrombectomy, which um, actually at least compared to the systemic thrombolysis works quite well. It has similar survival and actually less risk of stroke and readmission rate compared to the systemic lysis patients, 
while obviously these are usually very sick patients, the mortality can reach up to 27% or even beyond if you look at the patients treated with in extremis undergoing this procedure. But the problem is that obviously there is a limited availability to do this and there are very few centers when this can be done and these patients are very unwell to be transported to these centers. And you can see that this requires stenotomy or cardiopulmonary by bypass in hypothermia. So it's a quite an invasive procedure. And then we arrive to um, the minimal invasive or in collecting terms, what most of the guidelines call it is catheter directed treatments, which actually has a large variety of different um, equipment and techniques, but the, most of the guidelines don't differentiate between them. And I would like to limit this or, or simplify this just to talk about the ones which use um, thrombolytic administered locally into the clot, which is which can be called catheter directed to thrombolysis. And within that, the most of the data is from a special device called ECOS, or which is often called as ultrasound assisted um, thrombolysis. Or, and the other big group where we remove the clot mechanically, and out of these, the most two most frequently devices uh, would be the Indigo from Penumbra and the Flow Trever from Minare. Mm. So catheter-directed thrombolysis has been around for quite a few years now. You can do it with just simple uh, infusion catheters with multiple side holes parked in the clot, which would then infuse, as you can see in the picture, the clot with the thrombolytic drug. And obviously the advantage of this that you give it in a much lower dose and it goes directly into the clot. The procedure itself to place the catheter is usually very easy and very straightforward, uh, but then the lysis itself takes some time and the patient needs to be monitored uh, during the thrombolysis on an HD or ICU bed. And according to the data currently available, this still brings uh, not negligible a risk of bleeding, although it's lower than the systemic lysis, but still considerably high. Um, there are, to, to compare the studies available, it's difficult because they use different in infusion rates and times. And also we have to mention with any thrombolytic treatment that recently we have, we often face problems with like alter place shortage. So there has been a lot of, uh, problems around what to replace out of place with recently. So this is the most widely uh, used device for catheter thrombolysis, which use an additional um, um, feature to deliver ultrasound waves, ultrasound energy, which meant to break up the fibrin and, and allow the penetration of the thrombolytic drug more deeper into the clot. It's called ECOS, or now there is a new version of ECOS Plus, which um, allows even higher um, ultrasound energy delivery, and therefore hopefully even better um, breakdown of clot with lower need of thrombolytic drugs. So this is how it, it looks on X-ray when we place a catheter. It's got these little dark dots where the emission from the emission of the ultrasound waves happen. And these you can place two of these catheters, one into each side and, and let the lytic run over uh, several hours. The other group, the mechanical um, aspiration thrombectomy group has a big advantage of that it quickly removes a large volume of clot and therefore it can improve hemodynamic uh, impairments rapidly. Um, and also it often completes the treatment in a single session. So you don't need to, to put the patient on ICU or there will be a need for a significantly shorter stay on ICU. Uh, you use often the same or very similar equipment to, re, to remove DVT. So often you can treat the concomitant proximal or iliofemoral DVT at the same time. 
And the biggest advantage that most of these devices don't require using any thrombolytics, therefore the risk of systemic bleeding is really low. The disadvantage or drawback of these techniques that they can be technically much more challenging to do the procedure than just starting the catheter directed lysis, because we're talking about quite large ball um, catheters or equipment which have to pass through the heart into the pulmonary arteries and therefore there is a risk of problems at the venous access because of the large hole we make on the veins and also we can cause injury to the heart or to the pulmonary arteries. There is also a risk because these procedures work as aspiration, there's a risk of significant uh, blood loss during the procedure because you can aspirate significant amount of blood with the clots. The two equipments I mentioned already try to overcome this problem. Um, you know, I will go into details a bit later. Um, the other two problems I probably have to mention that these techniques evolve so quickly that the obviously the evidence struggle to keep up and therefore we don't know the don't know even have to bring them as a first line treatment. And also often these equipment cannot clear all the thrombus out and there is uh, no clear endpoints on when to stop the treatment apart from observing some improvement in hemodynamics of the patient while on the table. So this is one of the uh, most widely used aspiration thrombectomy devices from a company called Penumbra. It already underwent upgrades over the last few years. Initially, it was a eight branch catheter with a simple pump, which would be a, provide a continuous vacuum to aspirate clot. And it just recently been upgraded to the so-called lightning system with a larger catheter, which is 12 French. That's what we currently have available in our department and mostly available in the UK. The, only, the upgrade with this that it uses a little computer aided technology at the top, which monitors if the catheter is in free flow and uh, stops the aspiration to reduce blood loss. It also comes with an inner catheter called a separator, which helps to um, suck in any larger clots which would block the inflow to the catheter. And it is already to have another upgrade in the future where I think it's already out in the United States, which with an even larger 16 French catheter coming to the market and even some improvement with the computer assisted um, aspiration. And this is the newer version. The other uh, device is called Flow Retriever, which is the, a product from a company called Inari. It is a large ball catheter comes in various sizes from 16 to 24 French, and it uses a manual aspiration with a large bore syringe attached to the side port, and also uses these inner um, catheters with 19 or discs attached. On these comes in various sizes, which would help to to move the clot out of the the branches and closer to the aspiration catheter. They just come out with a newer version of this, which would help even more chronic glute to be removed from the vessel wall. Um, also the company just came up with this uh, additional um, sort of gadget to it, which is called Flow Saver, which is, has an, a filtration system um, to allow the aspirated blood with the clots to be separated from the, the blood it's, and then the blood can be given back to the patient to reduce um, blood loss. There are also all sorts of other equipments out in the market and it's difficult to, to know all of them. And, and they just a, a couple of examples. One is the Asprex catheter, which has been from, um, which is a, a rotational thrombectomy. There is this uh, infusion catheter for thrombolysis called Bashir catheter, which allows better penetration of the thrombolytic into the clot. And there is another company uh, called Angio Dynamics who came up with the Angiovac system, which is a very complicated system, but it was 
it's a, able to remove really large volumes of code, but requires like a cardiopulmonary bypass to work uh, and perfusionists to be present. And they just recently came out with a, a simplified version. I think it's called AlphaVac, which is a similar catheter, but with a, a manual pump just to aspirate the clot out. There is also another device called Jetty out there in the market, which uses um, an aspiration catheter with a special jet stream of saline in the origin of the catheter, which helps to break the clot out up before being aspirated. So who would benefit from the reperfusion? That would be the next part of my talk about. And based on the guidelines, we should use various parameters to stratify the patients to various risk categories. Um, these should be whether the patient is hemodynamically unstable, whether the patient has any imaging evidence of right ventricular dysfunction, and we can use certain biomarkers to, to search for any evidence for myocardial injury, troponin or BNP. And also we, we have to take into consideration all the basic clinical parameters and other, other conditions like concomitant DVT or underlying ac active cancer. So these are the crit criteria we use to decide whether a patient is hemodynamically unstable. Um, we can detect the right ventricular strain on the CTPA when the RV-LV ratio is above one, then there is a significant strain on the right ventricle. And we can also use uh, scoring systems, which is the, the um, pulmonary embolism severity index or the simplified version of it to help to um, stratify the patients. So the currently available ESC guideline from 2019 uh, puts the patients in a three different categories. The, the, the one with the called high risk PE are the ones who are in most need of intervention. They are hemodynamically unstable and they also have um, right heart strain and enzyme elevation. These patients are usually in extremis and they would definitely need clot removal to get them through the the acute phase. The more interesting group is the intermediate one where there are some patients who, especially the ones who bo have both uh, imaging evidence of um, right ventricular strain and biomarker elevations, which would be called intermediate high risk group, who something or we think that some of them would benefit from reperfusion because we know that five or up to even 20% can deteriorate over time and become going to the high risk group. And often then it's too late to intervene. So the big question is that how we would select all these patients who, who, who would deteriorate and would benefit from intervention. There is a chart from the, the more recent um, ESC workgroup uh, recommendations or consensus document, which would help to rule out with, or mm, find out which patients would benefit from on the intermediate high, high risk group from treatment. We're looking at the same parameters. And if, if any of these, one or two of these are present, they recommend to consider the patient for treatment. So if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, but has a heart rate above 100 or a blood pressure of between 19 or 100 or high respiratory rate, low saturation, severe RV dysfunction. These are all patients who are likely to, to not doing well on the long term. There is another interesting findings from the analysis of the flash registry, which found that up to one third of the intermediate high risk patients or up to, or more than 20% of the patients with a simplified severity index of zero can be in a so-called normal tensive cardiogenic shock, which means that they are maintaining their blood pressure, but their cardiac index is below 2.2 liters per minute per square meter. And these patients are 
very high risk for deterioration. And actually, it was proven that the um, Inari device um, helped them to improve their um, cardiac index, and all the hemodynamic improvement was significant when they were intervened. To identify these patients with normal tensile shock, they recommend to monitor, again, the similar parameters, whether there is elevated troponin, elevated BMP, reduced RV function, if there is a large volume set OP, is, if there is concomitant DVT, and if there is tachycardia. So these are the uh, parameters they recommend to put in together to create this composite shock score, which would indicate if the patient is in cardiogenic shock. So currently the ESC guideline recommends to do systemic thrombolysis for all the patients who are who have high risk PE, so hemodynamically unstable. But as I said previously, there is a large proportion of patients who cannot have the systemic lysis for various reasons, in, or if the systemic lysis fails in this only these cases, the guideline recommends to consider other options, including surgery or catheter-directed treatment. While for the intermediate high-risk group, the guideline only suggests to use thrombolytic therapy or as an alternative using other options as a rescue. So only when the patient deteriorates while on anticoagulation alone, should they be considered for reperfusion. Um, the more recent um, already mentioned consensus document from the pulmonary circulation group of ESC uh, suggests a very good algorithm where we would consider treatment or escalation of treatment to, to do thrombolysis or step forward and do catheter directed intervention if the treatment fails. And what they mean by failure is not just deterioration, but also if there is a lack of improvement over a certain period of time. And these they suggest if for high risk group or patients on lysis, there is no improvement in two to four hours after thrombolysis. Or for patients on anticoagulation, if their already compromised vital signs do not improve over 24, 48 hours. So they agree that there is no clear consensus that which vital parameters are best to monitor. And there, this would require more research, but they would, what they, they basically suggesting that we should try to intervene before the patient deteriorates and not to wait until they become hemodynamically unstable. Um, there is also some suggestions to start using the news two scoring in this, but currently there isn't enough data to support that the news two score is, is good enough to, to select these patients. So this is the, the flow chart or algorithm they recommend. So for, for the intermediate high-risk group, if there is a success for anticoagulation, so the patient stays well or improves over 24, 48 hours, they can stay on anticoagulation. But if there is no improvement or worsening, then they should get lysis. Or if the lysis does not work or, or cannot have lysis, then we should go for catheter-directed treatments. So going, moving forward towards the, to look at some evidence. So this is the major trials used for the ultrasound assisted thrombolysis uh, or the ECOS device over the years. Mm -hmm. um, there was one study in 2014, which um, compared um, the the device against anticoagulation alone, and it showed that it has better RV heavy reduction compared to the anticoagulated patients, and there was no significant bleeding risk. Uh, one year later, the Seattle 2 trial um, also, it was just a single arm study, but it shows significant hemodynamically hemodynamic improvement on all these patients treated, and there was no intracranial hemorrhage, but there was up to 10% of um, major or moderate bleed, according to the GUSTO criteria. 
So then they came up with the opt optimized trial where they were trying to figure out if they give a less amount of um, thrombolytic for a shorter duration of time and then stratify the patients in four different treatment arms. And what they found that there would be a, a sustained hemodynamic improvement with the patients receiving lower dose of thrombolytics for a shorter duration. Uh, and there was only uh, an overall 4% of major bleeding in, in all the groups, but the most of the bleeding occurred obviously in the higher dose uh, arms. Then later on, the knockout registry is, is more recent, which already um, evaluated nearly 500 patients, both intermediate and high risk group, and again showed um, similar good uh, reduction in RVRV um, ratio, no intracranial bleeding, and the total of major bleeding of 2.5%. And there are also also further trials going on in large scale RCTs, which haven't got intermediate results out there yet, as far as I know. It's worth to mention that there was one trial where they found no difference in between using the ultrasound and just using the normal catheter directed thrombolysis in terms of outcome. This is a, a chart from showing the, the the outcomes of the various um, trials around ECOS and just to compare against the duration and dose of the systemic lysis lytic dose and duration. So we can see that there has been a significant reduction in the use in the amount of lytic given and also the time they have been given for, while especially in the knockout registry, it shows that the despite of all this, the the efficacy in terms of hemodynamic improvement has not be, been impaired with that. And there is also a, a reduced bleeding risk with no intracranial hemorrhage. So we're moving towards a less a, a procedure which is less risky probably in terms of bleeding and has similar efficacy. For the Aspiration thrombectomy group, uh, this is the result from the first uh, registry uh, um, assessing the flow retrieval device called the FLARE registry, which again showed comparable, similarly good uh, hemodynamically, hemodynamic improvement for the flow retriever patients uh, compared to the catheter directed thrombolysis or systemic lysis groups, while the total risk of major bleeding was uh, significantly lower, just 0.9%. And there was a total of 3.8% major adverse event, but none of them were device related. So it, it looks like it's an effective device with very good safety profile. The Penumbra Indigo system also came out with their first uh, results in the Indigo trial. And we have to mention that was already the older version of eight French catheter used and with no um, computer-aided aspiration control. And that also showed similar, very good um, hemodynamic improvement and very good safety profile with only 1.7% major adverse events within 48 hours. And <clears throat> so the trials, so far usually focused on um, comparing risk versus benefit in terms of uh, comparing the short-term hemodynamic improvement or uh, improving mortality versus uh, the bleeding risk. But now with the, the data emerging that these new devices can treat the patient with significantly less bleeding risk, maybe there is time to refocus or research and think about what other outcomes, especially long-term outcomes, we should look at whether removing the clot burden will help the patients to uh, avoid the so-called post pulmonary embolism syndrome, to, which often results in reduced quality of life, um, 
reduced exercise tolerance and reduced peak oxygen uptake. So for, for these, there are already a, a lot of new trials out there. The one, the, one of the most exciting one would be the PE track trial, which would be an independent uh, large scale randomized trial, but also the companies um, started their new trials looking at long-term outcomes. Uh, the high PETHO is the one for the ECOS device, flash is for the flow triggers, and strike is for the, uh, the penumbra device. And the Inari flash registry has already come out with uh, in, in, in interim results for six months. And it's already showed that it, it again has a very good safety profile with 1.8% major adverse events and um, very good hemodynamic improvement of the patients, um, which was maintained and the improvement was maintained over six months. So we can see that the, pay, the RV LV ratio, the RV function have improved. Uh, the patient were without significant uh, shortness of breath. There was an improved in six minute walking test. There is an improvement in the P related quality of life scores. And there was a very low percentage of um, chronic pulmonary embolism related pulmonary hypertension and embolic, post embolic disease. Um, the only other thing we need to talk about is that um, the, pulmon the severe pulmonary embolism patients need some coordinated um, um, management. And for this, the so-called pulmonary embolism response team idea was created first in, in, in the Boston General Massachusetts Hospital. And now they are, these are called the PERT, PERT, PERT teams. And these have, since it started, it has grown into something quite big. And they, especially in the US, they try to coordinate and uh, expedite uh, multidisciplinary decision, decision making for these patients and increase the awareness around PE and also just trying to optimize and standardize the therapy, the follow-up, the research. So it's, it's, uh, it's mainly in the US, but it's uh, sort of infiltrating to other parts of the world, including the UK. Even the ESC guideline in endorse the use of the PERP team. And there has been a, a, a meta-analysis showing that there is a trend towards lower mortality in centers where they use these per teams, but also there is an increase in use of advanced therapies, but no increase in bleeding complications. So these are all the specialities who should be ideally on, on the team. And uh, obviously we should try to get as many people involved as possible. Um, in the UK, and it's based on our own experience, um, it's not that straightforward because uh, there are big differences locally and who, who would be the owner, who, who has the ownership of treating these patients or who's in charge of the care of the patients, who follows them up. It, it's, it varies between respiratory medicine to acute medicine, sometimes um, cardiology. It, there is a great variability whether there is available on the availability of additional therapies, uh, including the ECMO uh, for very severe patients uh, for, for ECMO and other um, supportive therapies might be needed. But the biggest problem currently is that, that um, there is no established funding if you want to create these, these uh, PERT groups. And there is not enough interest amongst, amongst the, um, physicians, at least, for example, in our institute, the one of the reasons why we couldn't set up the per group to, to, go, to function as a 24-7 service, because we don't have enough uh, mm, mm, physicians who could provide the cover with enough interest and expertise in PE. So in conclusion, the advanced reperfusion treatments, especially the catheter-directed treatments, 
have gone through a um, significant improvement recently, and they already play an important role in the treatment algorithm for severe PE, which everyone who deals with PE patients should be aware of and think about the options. Uh, we should understand better that who would be those intermediate high-risk patients that would benefit from um, reperfusion, especially by preventing them from deterioration. And obviously we need more research and more robust data for these uh, treatment modalities to become actually first-line treatments in PE and on the long term to understand that um, reperfusion, what, what effect reperfusion has on long-term sequel of, of PE, whether we would prevent any long-term post-traumatic damage of the lungs. And also, uh, and probably that's the probably most importantly, we need to increase the awareness of, um, of these treatment modalities or, or we need to create a more robust and multidisciplinary approach how these patients are managed. Uh, so basically we need to create functioning per teams with clear pathways and hopefully we can identify fundings for these mm, teams to work. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. That was an extremely informative presentation and um, taking us across both the evidence, the suitability and the potential outcomes. And I think when you um, talked about the further research in particular around long-term outcomes for patients that may bring benefit from this. Um, that was, you know, really interesting to see whether it would improve their longer-term outcome. But one of the things you highlighted is a, as an issue that despite the registry looking really positive in the flash registry that you showed, was um, obviously if physicians need to be highly skilled to administer this and time to treatment, I presume, is it has to be extremely timely to to get to that patient or the patient to get to the right center. So is there any network or regional resource that um, if a center doesn't have this, they can link up or begin to network to see how that could um, collaborate? I mean, that, I mean, if we're talking about the UK only, I think it's, mm -hmm. it's uh, very variable depending on where we are. So for example, in Bristol, we have two major trusts look treating these patients uh, with a completely different approach and availability of various treatments, but we just started to reach out to each other to, to create a citywide um, approach to this. Um, we already, as I said, we, we started to set up our own PERT team, which is currently, we just like to be called an interest group because uh, it's just a few enthusiasts trying to create better coordination on the, on the care of these patients, but we, we cannot yet provide a 24 seven cover because there are, there are simply not enough people who we can get on board, but we're working on it. And, and I think that's, that should be the goal for, for most of the people listening, probably my talk out there, there to, to try to get um, um, other um, specialities involved and get more and more people to be aware of this, these treatment options and, and set up something locally, some some robust pathway for these patients because often these patients are not not looked after by as as, as well as as they should they often lost in between various specialities especially for their follow-up so no one is really taking ownership or on this on the PE patients on the long term so that's that's the thing we need to we need to work on and then we can create better outcomes Anybody watching this afternoon or who watched the uh, recording later, if they want to network or learn more and, and liaise, can they contact you or is there um, an organization they can contact to to begin that? Sorry, to, to contact about? Um, about um, better collaboration, working um, together or, or just initiating any of this and finding out more. Yeah, I, I, I think... The, the more people get together, getting together to, to discuss this and get on board, the better it is. And then the, the, the more we reach out to each other and, and share our knowledge and our own little exp expertise, 
the, the quicker we can develop something robust. So uh, I think everyone is encouraged to to reach out to the to the local um, P P group if there is any or if, or even to us or there are there are there are quite a few groups now in the UK now who are working on this and probably there are even better larger per teams who are functioning much better than ours. We 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 just recently started this. So so yes, definitely. So first to look locally if you can't find anything locally. Yeah, obviously the, the problem with, with reaching out further in terms of the, your, your own patients is that most of the times these, these patients are very difficult to, to transfer to another center. So they are too unwell to be transferred. So if you, if you don't have the treatment options locally, then that could be a problem. How you would get them to somewhere else where they can receive the treatment. And probably that's why we need to think about the, all those patients who might need these treatments and transfer them be until before they get hemodynamic stable. And then in a practical way, if, if a patient undergoes this treatment and it's successful, does their subsequent treatment follow them, um, the anticoagulation and the, and the routine um, uh, pathway, or, or is it different in any other way? Well, currently, the guidelines don't, uh, I don't think there is any any guidance out there to have any different treatment than just the normal post p protocols of anticoagulation and i i think one of the problems we identify that these patients often not followed up as as vigorously as they probably should to find out how they're doing on the long term so no one really knows or there is very little data on on, on the long-term outcome, how, how patients are doing after a severe PE, they just release to the community and stay on anticoagulation. A question that I'd received as well is, is there any evidence or, or um, work on patient feedback? Anybody who's received this treatment and their feedback afterwards, because obviously they probably don't have anything to compare it to, but um, on on how they on their outcomes or anything, do, is there any feedback from patients included, or will there be in the future? Uh, I'm not aware of anything um, set up right now, anything like officially or any, any way to feedback. Obviously, individually from a few patients we treated, we had some nice feedbacks, but well, we we haven't got anything set up as such. But on the long term, definitely the patient-driven uh, outcomes are the most important ones we should focus on. So, so, and I think the most of the studies are looking into this in the in the long term. And I think the quality of life. Yeah. Yes. As well, thank you. Um, and so going forward, where would you in hope to see this in five or ten years' time? Well, in five or ten years' time, it would be. A, 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 a lot in terms of, again, probably we'll have much better equipment and we would overcome from the technical point of view a lot of difficulties, which we cur still currently have with these, these new great devices. So usually the technical improvement is quicker than the backing evidence. So that's always going to be a problem, but hopefully by then we will have the catheter directed treatments in the first line treatment options in the guidelines and we will have a better understanding on how we prevent the long-term problems created from a severe PE so we, we prevent all these uh, long-term pulmonary hypertensions and other other issues these patients might have and I think certainly from our perspective what you have to remember is often some of these patients are very young and they would have been looking forward to a very fit active life so if there is an intervention that can improve that long-term quality of life, it would be hugely welcome. Um, going slightly wider, uh, somebody in the audience has asked, what special considerations would there be for pregnant patients? Uh, there will be, well, it's, it's not contraindicated in pregnancy. Uh, if obviously, if, if the mother's life needs to be saved, we need to, we need to do everything we can. Um, there is very little data focusing on pregnant patients. So I don't think there is any evidence out there, but, but we ourselves haven't treated any pregnant patients. So I don't have any personal experience, but most of these procedures would be technically doable. Obviously 
uh, giving thrombolysis with being pregnant is, is probably not something we should do. So um, the mechanical options are, are the ones reserved for, for, um, for pregnant patients. And, and they, they actually technically probably do a ball, but we don't have a, much data to support the safety in, in pregnancy yet. Okay. Thank you very much. I think we've exhausted all the questions, but thank you.